Hi there, everybody. My name is Lauren Spring, and I'm an art educator with the Art Gallery of Ontario. Today, I'm going to take you on a brief virtual tour of one of our new and very exciting exhibitions, all about Studio 54. Now, I also want to let you know that this particular virtual tour uh, is part of an ongoing partnership between the Art Gallery of Ontario and the Koffler Centre for Performing Arts, as well as Dancing with Parkinson's. Um, we're going to be having a couple of other events coming up uh, in association with this exhibition and this ongoing partnership in the coming weeks and months. So please do check out the AGO website if you're interested. Now to our virtual tour. Here is our beautiful Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, we really do hope that we're going to be able to open our doors soon and welcome you back in to see this exhibit in person. Uh, please do keep checking out the AGO website and listening to the news uh, and you'll be able to find out as soon as you're able to come in safely uh, to the gallery again. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land that the Art Gallery of Ontario is on is the territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississauga Nation, and was also the territory of the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the Federal Government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe Nation. Toronto has always been a trading center for First Nations. I wanted to just start our tour um, with this little quote from Truman Capote. Um, he said this in 1979, uh, and he said that Studio 54 is everything uh, the way it ought to be. It's very democratic. It's all kinds of colors, all kinds of sizes, boys and boys together, girls and girls together, girls and boys together, poor people, rich people, taxi drivers, anything you want. It's all mixed up together. And that's what I like about it. Um, I just thought it would be a neat thing to, uh, <laughs> to share this idea with you. It's certainly one of the most popular ones about Studio 54. Um, it's gone down in the history books as being this very inclusive space. And in many ways it was, and we're gonna delve into that together. Um, but in other, in other ways, it was, it was kind of exclusive. And we'll talk more about that too. Um, so yeah, let's transport back now to 1977 in Midtown Manhattan. Um, and the excitement that is Studio 54. All right. Um, I wanted to share this image with you um, in large part because uh, as I was walking through the exhibition and reviewing all of the images that were in there, uh, this one struck me particularly hard. Uh, it's not a particularly special event at Studio 54. In fact, it's a rather ordinary evening. Um, but it definitely harkens back to a time when we could all go out in large groups, dance and sweat alongside countless others, get dressed up in clothes that weren't sweatpants, <laughs> meet friends of friends who had just arrived in town from far away and strike up conversations, kiss strangers, you know, speak moistly <laughs> to each other over loud music and just sort of let go. And this looking at this from, you know, early 2021, this seems like such a far, far away thing <laughs> um, and a relic almost from another era. Um, at the time, Studio 54 really represented freedom and liberation. And uh, we'll talk more about the details <laughs> of, of why it, it came to represent these things. But, you know, looking at looking at this particular image right now, too, I feel that just being able to do this, just to go out with strangers and, and dance and party would, uh, would be its own kind of freedom. Um, a couple of interesting facts about this exhibition on at the AGO. So um, our version of Studio 54 comes to us from the Brooklyn Museum. And essentially it traces the radiant history, the social politics, the trailblazing aesthetics of one of the most iconic nightclubs of all time. Uh, the exhibition itself has more than 650 objects, 
And these are made up of photographs, um, kind of fashion. We actually have like models wearing, wearing fashion of the era, accessories, uh, film clips, drawings, um, and other sort of ephemera. We have guest lists and, and other kind of neat, <laughs> um, neat actual tangible things that were used at the time in association with the club. Interestingly, the club only was open from April uh, 1977 to February 1980. So it was really only in operation for 33 months, but even in that limited short time, it did change nightlife forever. In many ways, Studio 54 represented a convergence of different socio-cultural and historical events. So some of the key ones were, um, it, it was post-war Jimmy Carter era, uh, essentially the aftermath of 1975, the recession, um, meaning that rents in Manhattan in, in New York City were relatively cheap. So suddenly there were lots of artists who could afford to live there and flock to the area. Um, LGBTQ liberation, racial diversification, especially in a big city like New York. Um, and it was essentially kind of the um, disco and uh, and the birth of punk and counterculture sort of all coming together. Uh, I've also heard it called, you know, this kind of sweet spot, 1977 to 1980, of being the post-birth control and pre-AIDS era. So sexual liberation was huge as well. Um, and yeah, and I think large cities like New York um, were really forward thinking when it came to diversity. And these nightclubs played an important, important role in America. And they fostered the congregation of people from across social, political, sexual, and financial strata. Uh, it was essentially opened by Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager. Um, and the, the studio itself, Studio 54, used to be a former opera house. And so as we move through the slideshow together, you're gonna to see some images of um, how they transported and transformed, you know, what used to be a very theatrical place and different theatrical kind of iconic backdrops and everything into the nightclub atmosphere. Um, I think uh, it's also important to note that, um, yeah, the, the discotheques and nightclubs where people danced to recorded music in the 60s and 70s really coincided with the civil rights movement, um, which, yeah, championed the right of, of all people, including Black Americans and members of the LGBTQ plus community. Interestingly, uh, in this period, it was illegal for men to dance together. And when they would go out at night, gay men would often carry what they term jail money with them. Um, just in case they needed to post bail uh, based on getting arrested for their relatively, <laughs> what we would consider today, commonplace behavior. Um, Studio 54, by opening their doors to members only, or by invitation only, um, Studio 54 and other clubs in New York were able to pre-screen their guests, which basically you know, meant that they had a, would allow entry only to people who were gay or gay friendly. And this club and others like it were kind of one of the only safe spaces for members of the LGBTQ plus community at the time. Uh, here's another great slide. You can see this is one of um, a busboy who worked at the club and a woman making quite, <laughs> quite a hilarious face behind him too. Um, the busboys from Studio 54 have become quite legendary too. Um, a lot of people would flock to Studio 54 to, to kind of see the celebrities there partying and sort of hobnob with the rich and famous, but also to see these busboys. They, they had a particular aesthetic. Um, the, there was a designer, Ronald Colozzi, and he designed the, the uniform, which I guess you can call it a uniform. It's basically a really tight tennis shorts and these what were sometimes knee-high socks um, and these white tennis shoes. And so it was kind of a, a nod to gay culture and kind of high camp. Um, and interestingly, one of the founders, Steve Rubell, would be the one kind of interviewing potential busboys and other staff. And he would remind them in the interview that they would have to, you know, were they given the position, they would have to maintain their appearance. Uh, they were given often gym memberships uh, or encouraged to take dance classes. And so you can see they were quite fit. 
Um, and yeah, and the club policy also required these busboys to have stylish haircuts and maintain clean shaven faces and bodies. So that's a bit of the, the aesthetic there. Here is one of my favorite images from the show. Uh, you can see by uh, Ron Galela, the photographer. And this is a, an image of Grace Jones and Andy Warhol. So two of those aforementioned celebrities who frequented Studio 54. Um, some of the biggest parties at Studio 54 were New Year's Eve, and I'll talk more about that momentarily, um, but also kind of uh, premier parties. And this one was taken uh, during the premier party of Greece. I imagine many of you tuning in today uh, know the movie Greece very well. Hard to imagine that it ever, you know, there was ever a world before Greece existed. Uh, it's such an iconic film. Um, but yeah, it would make sense. It would attract so many big celebrities. And so here we have Grace Jones and Andy Warhol um, at the premiere in 1978. Uh, interesting, you know, as much as, as the Truman Capote quote speaks about inclusivity and certainly uh, Studio 54 was a safe space in many ways for many otherwise um, marginalized people. Uh, you did still have to be considered cool enough to get in. And that meant you either had to be a celebrity or you had to have the right fashion sense or the right body type. Um, almost every single night there was a guest list. And so if you weren't on it, you'd basically have to line up at the door and just hope that you chose the right style and shirt and were with the right people that night to be allowed in because the vast majority of people kind of banging on the doors uh, wanting to party would be turned away. Um, Steve Rubel, one of those, the co-founders who I mentioned would often be at the door and he would kind of, you know, choose <laughs> in the moment who was cool enough to come to the party and who wasn't. Uh, he was once quoted as saying, the key to a good party is filling a room with guests who are more interesting than you. So I suppose that was one of his credos when choosing who would be allowed in or not on any given evening. Um, but certainly big name celebrities like Grace Jones and um, Andy Warhol would, would always get a pass. So for those who don't know or, or maybe just know part of her biography, Grace Jones was one of the most influential and celebrated supermodels of the 70s. Um, and she really kind of blossomed at Studio 54 on their main stage uh, where she would perform regularly. She moved from Jamaica to New York when she was only 13 years old, and that was in the early 60s, um, after relocating to Paris in her 20s, and then she began modeling for major fashion houses around the world. Um, it was in 1977, again, the year that Studio 54 first opened its doors, that uh, Grace Jones really began her music career. So it was really on the main stage of Studio 54 that she, she grew as a musician, uh, she also served as a muse for many of the designers who frequented Studio 54, including Norma Kamali, who we're going to be speaking about uh, a little bit later on in the tour, who would often make custom stage outfits for her iconic performances. Um, for her New Year's Eve party at Studio 54, uh, Kamali made a kind of very, very special outfit for, for Grace Jones. And uh, that was one of the most iconic and, and memorable performances because she emerged actually from this large cobra's mouth uh, that framed the main stage. And she was holding a white uh, fox fur blanket on her. And for the next 20 minutes, she basically sang while she slowly did a strip tease, removing layers of her outfit. And Jones was flanked by male dancers wearing breakaway pants, which she gradually took off to reveal jock straps and guns. So too bad we all missed that live show. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting too that Andy Warhol uh, was such a, a major feature of Studio 54. Those who are familiar with his work as a pop artist will know that he you know, had a, a, an obsession with celebrity culture um, and uh, you know, himself kind of played this role of was he sort of pretending to take on this this celebrity role, was he actually being drawn into it and uh, enjoying the spotlight? 
Uh, and so it is quite neat to see how many times he appears in the photos of <laughs> in our in our Studio 54 exhibition. Um, they, it was also, you know, a place where if you were to show up there one night and go to a big party it, and you were a celebrity or someone of note, um, your picture would most likely appear in the tabloids the next day. So um, Ron Galela, who took this picture, was actually one of the most famous tabloid photographers who frequented Studio 54. And he often worked in collaboration with not only the tabloids, but um, also the founders of Studio 54 and the owners and, and the other staff there. Um, you know, he, he was known to be one of the best. He would take the most candid shots of celebrities. He, interestingly, would always carry two cameras. One would be black and white and one would be color. Um, and he would basically shoot images in both because the very next day he'd go to, uh, to sell them to particular tabloids and they all had different regulations. Sometimes they had to be black and white, other times they had to be color. Uh, and so depending on uh, who he was submitting to the very next day, uh, he'd, he'd you know, submit an envelope of a black and white or a color uh, photograph. And um, he, you know, as much as he he really helped enhance <laughs> the reputation of Studio 54, because you know uh, Rubel and Schreiger knew very well that if if you know little uh, events from the party were showing up in the tabloids the next day, that just made for good press for Studio 54 and in in kind of enhance the spotlight on the club. Um, but at the same time, Ron Galela was often seen as a bit of a pest. <laughs> he was one of the kind of early members of the paparazzi, as we, we might think of it today, really hiding in places, trying to capture celebrities, not always in their most attractive moments. Um, he would often kind of elbow other people to get out of the, <laughs> out of the way. Um, and so he ended up being banned twice, but even still in the exhibition, you'll see tons and tons of photographs taken by him. We have another example of one right here. So again, a photo by Ron Galela. And this one is a, is a photograph of Bianca Jagger. And this was on the occasion of her birthday party. So she was the wife of Mick Jagger. Um, and in May of 1997, uh, there was this big birthday bash that was thrown for her. It was well attended. It garnered much media attention. Um, there were pictures in the tabloids the next day of her feeding cake to Mick Jagger, it appeared on the front page of the Daily News. Um, inside that issue, there was a spread, a full page spread titled The Wee Hours, High Times. And it showcased a photo of Bianca Jag Jagger um, on, on the, riding in on a white horse, um, which is how she kind of entered her own party. And um, this is one of the most iconic images of Studio 54 now, her on the white horse. And we do have that one in the exhibition as well. So you can come check that one out in person. And this is another one from, from the party. So you can see lots of, <laughs> lots of interesting things happening there. The other, uh, the other person who's here beside her in the little bow tie is Steve Rubel. So again, one of the founders and co-owners of Studio 54. And, um, uh, he, you know, had his own really interesting story, him and Schreiger, uh, you know, were highly celebrated and then ended up being charged with tax evasion and a variety of other crimes. They had to pay fines and um, also ended up both serving prison sentences. They were in, in jail, the two of them, from February 1980 into uh, April 1981. And it was, you know, it's a big long story, but quickly after that, Studio 54 was sold and then shut down. So it was really just this kind of 33 month uh, period where it was, it was in its heyday. Um, and when he was released from prison, 1981, um, that also happened to be the same year that AIDS was really discovered. Um, that's the year that the first article um, about the virus appeared in the New York Times. The article was titled, A Rare Cancer Seen in 41 Homosexuals. Uh, in the coming years, AIDS-related illnesses would claim the lives of many friends of Studio 54. 
So it took a really heavy toll, obviously, on those who were partying there and, and part of this kind of sexual liberation movement. Um, and Steve Rubell himself ended up dying of, of AIDS uh, in July of 1989. And interestingly, he had learned years earlier that he had contracted HIV, um, likely from you know, shenanigans and encounters at Studio 54 itself. But um, after his death, because of the stigma that was surrounding AIDS and HIV, uh, his actual obituary listed that his cause of death was hepatitis and septic shock, not not AIDS. And I think you know we can all probably understand why that was the case at the time. But certainly since then, those close to him um, have have revealed what what most suspected and and many confirmed. We have another really great photo here by Ron Galela once again. As I mentioned, you can see some are black and white and then others in color, depending on the, the tabloid he was attempting to sell them to. <laughs> so this one here is of Margaret Trudeau. So some Canadian content in this show. Uh, so we, many Canadians probably know who Margaret Trudeau is. Uh, she now today is known as the first woman in history to have been wife of one Canadian prime minister and the mother to another, interestingly. Um, and she was a, a real regular fixture at Studio 54. Um, there was a very large age difference between her and Pierre Trudeau. So he was 29 years older than her. And she married him when she was only 22. And uh, he certainly had a reputation for being charismatic and, you know, a partier and, uh, and she, lived up to that as well. And um, she didn't want to conform to regular conventional notions of how the wife of a politician should behave in public. And, you know, she kind of famously would often smoke pot in front of her security detail. And she would often spend nights partying with the Rolling Stones. <laughs> um, this is after she had separated from uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. And uh, she would frequently travel to New York City and be seen at Studio 54. So this is one of many, many pictures of her kind of partying at, at Studio 54. This particular one was, she was there for a tennis benefit party. You can see in November, 1977. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, images in the exhibition. Uh, you can see it's by uh, Dustin Pittman, who was, was another photographer at the time. And um, it's of Steve Rubell again and Carmen D'Alessio. But uh, more interesting is actually what they're wearing here. <laughs> you can see uh, this is not just a, a regular jacket. <laughs> These are um, uh, Norma Kamali's infamous uh, coats, her sleeping bag coats. And looking at this picture, we get a good idea of some of the eccentric fashions of the day. Uh, Norma Kamali was one of the most famous designers at the time. And uh, yeah, one of the things that she was best known for were these large, warm uh, sleeping bag coats. She also famously made clothes out of silk parachutes. And we have some really beautiful examples of other designs of hers that uh, uh, are shown on mannequins in the, in the exhibition itself. So in this photo, um, uh, like I mentioned, we can see Steve Rubell and Carmen D'Alessio. And, and uh, D'Alessio was an actress and a nightlife lover. And while she you know, hasn't gone down in the history books as being an official co-founder of Studio 54, uh, she she really was a key player, and there's been some interesting research in recent years talking about her involvement in, um, you know, making Studio 54 happen. She fortunately avoided uh, prison <laughs> uh, herself, along with the, the other founders, but uh, her own history is quite compelling, too. And Kamali's influential designs of the 1970s... Um, 
are frequently re-editioned today. So her, these styles, even though you might not see lots of folks walking down the street wearing these sleeping bag coats, um, the styles really do live on. Um, and one of, there's an excellent quote by one of Steve Rubell's assistants um, who speaks to how and why these sleeping bag coats were invented. And uh, she recalls her experience uh, first encountering them. She says, only a few women worked at Studio 54 during the day. The best perk of all was that we were invited to Norma Kamali's seasonal sample sales. We knew Norma's story, how she was literally on her own with nothing left after a divorce, except a sleeping bag in the middle of an empty living room. Hence the inspiration for the sleeping bag coat. Um, and then she goes on to say that after Ian and Steve's studio closed, after Studio 54 closed down, after uh, the charges and prison and everything, that all of the staff faced a very bleak decade, scarred by the fear of AIDS and the deaths of loved ones. And um, Myra Shear says that during the darkest times of my own spiritually empty living room, I literally slept in that coat. It was my comforter then, and today it remains an inspiration. Uh, which, you know, I think perhaps we can relate to today. I think many of us are <laughs> maybe over the past 10 months, maybe now you're feeling good, but maybe over the past 10 months at some point, you know, you had a dark moment, you've been huddled up inside and in something cozy just for comfort. And uh, you can see why these sleeping bag coats might have provided that for many who were really struggling at the time. This is another great image here. Um, this, I think, really shows the theatricality of Studio 54. In a, in a brief slideshow like this, I can't do everything justice, but certainly once you're able to visit the exhibition and you, you see the films especially, uh, just, yeah, how these events transpired and, uh, and just the, the, the pomp and the circumstance surrounding uh, just being there it was this this interesting hybrid of of sure it was a discotheque and a nightclub but it also felt like you were kind of at a Broadway show and there were set pieces that were borrowed from Broadway and set designers who you know worked in in films and and theater and uh, so it was just this real kind of hard to define hub of of creativity and um, art um, and so. <laughs> This was a, one of the most iconic images of Studio 54. And essentially several times on any given night, uh, this moon and spoon would fly in from stage left and stage right. You know, the spoon would come from stage right, the moon from stage left, and they'd sort of meet in the middle. And uh, the spoon would kind of twinkle and a string of lights would zip up the moon's nose. And you could probably guess, given the time period and some of the, uh, you know, laws that were being broken in such a space, you can probably guess that this, uh, these sparkling lights from the spoon um, were meant to suggest cocaine use. Uh, certainly, there's much evidence that, uh, uh, you know, drugs and <laughs> were, were being used at, at the club frequently. Um, of course, cocaine was illegal at the time, as it is now, but it was popular uh, amongst club goers, and its nickname was Disco Dust during the 1970s. And so again, this particular set kind of signifies the spirit of liberation uh, that reigned at Studio 54. Uh, this was designed by um, Aerographics, which was actually um, uh, a duo, a design duo, which was made up of Richie Williamson and uh, Dean Janoff. And they designed and executed this particular moon and spoon backdrop. And yeah, it really has gone down in, in history. Um, sometimes sets and backdrops would be even more immersive. Uh, oftentimes Studio 54's decor evoked the bright lights of New York City, um, but Steve Rubell also said in 1977 that um, one of the intentions was to, it brought indoors the drama of the natural world, kind of sunrises and sunsets and snowstorms and rains and all in one night. And so, uh, yeah, when I talk about these parties being kind of immersive and all encompassing, it would even go beyond the, 
and the idea of a Broadway show and, and kind of break down the fourth wall and suddenly you feel like you're in a rainstorm or, you know, it's, it's two in the morning, but somehow the sun is rising inside and, uh, yeah, it, it must have been just a bit trippy. <laughs> Whether or not you, you partook in the drugs available must have been a little bit trippy just to kind of see that and be so fully immersed in that with so many other people. Um, one of the most iconic parties and, and famous ones was uh, the 1978 New Year's Eve party. And um, the theme of the night was the idea of standing on stardust and uh, a florist and event designer, Rennie Reynolds, actually brought barrels that were filled with, at first, what appeared to be glitter, and everyone was already excited about that. There were lots of barrels of glitter, but then it turned out that it wasn't just glitter, it was actual diamond dust in a variety of sizes. And this one really went down in history because if you were in attendance there, you would have noted that the floor itself was like covered um, in literally two tons of diamond dust. And then another two tons were sprinkled onto the crowd at random points throughout the evening. And uh, for kind of months later, a lot of those who attended claimed that, uh, uh, you know, they would still have diamond dust kind of twinkling on their clothes or found in different corners of, of their apartments and stuff. Um, and you know, that's a kind of nice image, I think, to have, and <laughs> perhaps one way that these events lived on, even when the club itself closed. And here's another uh, photograph of some of the, this one's also by Dustin Pittman. So just to give you a sense of some of these great costumes happening uh, on New Year's Eve, especially Halloween was also a big, a big party time. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it gives you a good sense of uh, the wildness you might have encountered there. Um, here is another photo by Ron Galela, another one from the Greece premiere. Um, this is uh, Diane von Fustenberg, who was one of the designers, one of the costume designers of Greece. So the same, the same kind of opening night party where we saw the picture of Grace Jones and Andy Warhol. And yeah, I wanted to uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in for this virtual tour. We're certainly very eager to, to have you all back in person and experience the, the wonder that is Studio 54 in whatever capacity we're, we're able to live it again uh, now in 2021. So please do keep checking out the AGO website uh, for updates on when we're gonna reopen. The exhibition is completely installed already. And so essentially we're just waiting, <laughs> waiting for the go ahead from the government to invite folks back in and all safety measures will be in place. Um, but yeah, it's really worth seeing because this was just a brief little taste, but we have 650 other objects, films, photographs, um, costume pieces, everything uh, that we're really hoping that uh, you'll be able to come and see sometime soon. So thank you all again very much for, for tuning in to this little virtual tour. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Take good care, everyone.